Hello again. This is section 7.5, more trigonometric equations. So what we're going to focus on in this section are some more involved equations that involve trig functions that are now going to require us to use a lot more of those identities that we've looked at early in this unit. All right, so our first example here, we've got solve the equation 1 plus sine theta equals 2 cosine squared theta. So I notice here that I've got two different trig functions, right? I have a sine and I have a cosine. There's nothing in common between any of the terms here, so no common factors. And I know I can't just isolate a trig function since there are multiple trig functions involved. So what I'm going to have to do here is think about those identities that we know that we might be able to substitute in here so that we can at least get everything in this equation in terms of the same trig function. Well, I know that I have a trig function that says that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one, right? And so since I have a, a cosine squared in this equation, that's the one I'm going to want to use here. So I'm going to solve this now for cosine squared, which is going to give us cosine squared theta is equal to one minus sine squared theta. So in place of cosine squared, I can now put one minus sine squared. So our equation becomes one plus sine theta equals two times one minus sine squared theta. And now I have an equation where everything's in terms of sine. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and distribute this two. So that's gonna give us one plus sine theta equals two minus two sine squared theta. And at this point, we have a quadratic, which we saw in the previous section. And so what we want to do now is set this thing equal to zero, move everything to one side of your equation, so we can look to see if we might be able to factor it. Okay? And so I'm going to add the two sine squared theta. I already have my sine theta. And if I subtract two from both sides, that's going to give us a minus one. And now this is equal to zero. Okay, so again, just moving everything to one side of that equation. Now I look and I see I have a trinomial. It is quadratic because of the square. So I'm going to see if we might be able to factor this. Well, to get a two sine squared theta, I'm going to need a two sine theta and a one sine theta. And then our factors of one down here are just one and one. And so now we just need to think about the signs. Since I want a positive sine squared in the middle, I need these outer terms to give us a positive two sine theta. So my plus is going to go down here. And then I'm going to need a minus one sine theta in the middle here. That way I get that negative one at the end. Okay, so this is our factored form. Once we have it factored, remember now we can set each of our factors equal to zero. So we're going to have two sine theta minus one equals zero and sine theta plus one equals zero now if we solve this first one i just need to isolate the sine theta so i'm going to add the one so we get two sine theta equals one divide by two so we get sine theta equals one half and now we use our inverse so theta is equal to the inverse sine of one half. And again, at this point, we just think about our unit circle and where we have values of sine that are equal to one half. And so those places should be pi over six and five pi over six. And as always, since we're asked to solve this, it doesn't tell us a specific domain. We need to include all solutions. So both of these are going to have a plus 2 pi k to account for those revolutions beyond those two values. And now the other factor, I'm going to subtract the 1. So we get sine theta equals negative 1. Again, I'm going to use my inverse. So theta equals inverse sine of negative 1. And again, we think about our unit circle and where we have a sine value of negative one. So that's where the y value would be negative one. The only place that happens on the unit circle is at three pi over two. And then again, because we have a period of two pi for sine, we have to add two pi to k. And so our solutions to this equation now are here and here.
So again, in general, the things that tip me off that I'm going to have to use one of those identities, I have two different trig functions, sine and cosine in this equation. I don't have any way to factor or anything like that up front. And so I have to look for ways that I can substitute to get everything in terms of the same trig function first. All right, so our next one here, we've got sine of two theta minus cosine theta equals zero. Now, again, similar to the last one, I've got two different trig functions, sine and cosine, no factoring that can be done here. And so we're going to have to use an identity to try to get these things in terms of either the same trig function or at least something that I might be able to work with. Well, the only identity I notice here is that sine of two theta, I can rewrite as two sine theta cosine theta. So I'm going to start that way. So we have two sine theta cosine theta minus cosine theta equals zero. Now, once we do that, now I actually have a common factor. I have a cosine in both terms here. So I can actually factor that out. So we're going to take out the cosine theta. If I do that, that's going to leave us with two sine theta. And then the other term just becomes a minus one. And at this point, now that it's factored, I can actually set each factor equal to zero because each factor has a different trig function in it. So we're going to have cosine theta equals zero and two sine theta minus one equals zero. Now this first factor, we can just take the inverse cosine. So theta equals inverse cosine of zero. Again, we're going to go to our unit circle now and think about where we have a cosine value or an x value of zero. And there's actually two places on the unit circle where that happens. We're going to get pi over two and three pi over two. And again, since we're solving this and finding all possible solutions, make sure we have our plus two pi k for each one of those. Okay, now the other factor, I need to get sine by itself, so I'm going to add the one first. So we get two sine theta equals one. Now I can divide by two. Sine theta equals one half. And now we do our inverse. So theta equals inverse sine of one half. And again, we've done this one several times now, the inverse sine of one half, the two values that would give us that are pi over six and five pi over six. And again, for all solutions, we have to add that two pi k. And so this time, first factor gives us these two pieces, and our second factor is going to give us these two pieces over here. Again, just some things to start looking for whenever you have multiple trig functions in an equation, no way to factor or simplify up front, then go ahead and look for identities that you might be able to use to substitute so that you might actually be able to factor at that point. All right, now this time we've got cosine theta plus one is equal to sine theta. Now it's asking us to solve this just in the interval from zero to two pi. So when we find our solutions, they're just asking us to find all the ones that are within one full revolution, that's all. Now, I notice here that I've got two different trig functions, right? We have a cosine and we have a sine. So there's no way to just get everything and isolate a trig function. I also notice though, that I only have a cosine theta, which we don't really have many identities that just involve cosine by itself. Same thing with sine. And if I want to get these all in terms of the same trig function, there's no good way to do that as this equation stands right now. However, if I could get a cosine squared or a sine squared, I do have an identity there that would help us to get everything in terms of the same trig function. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to square both sides of this equation. Okay, so I'm going to take everything over here and square it. And I'm going to take everything over here and do the same thing. And that way I get that cosine squared and that sine squared so that I might be able to use that Pythagorean identity and get everything in terms of the same trig function now. 
Now remember, when we square a binomial cosine theta plus one, we have to use FOIL here. So we're really going to get cosine squared theta plus two cosine theta plus one. Because that's cosine theta plus one times cosine theta plus one. Use FOIL. And once we combine like terms, this is what we should get. On the other side now, we're just squaring the sine. So that's going to give us sine squared theta. Now I look and I say, well, I've got two different terms that have cosine. I only have one that has a sine and it's a sine squared. So I'm going to try to get everything in terms of cosine this time. And so I'm going to take this sine squared. I'm going to use my identity, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. And I'm going to solve for sine squared. So that's going to give us sine squared theta equals one minus cosine squared theta. So in place of sine squared on the right-hand side, I'm going to put 1 minus cosine squared instead. So everything on the left stays the same. And over here now, we get 1 minus cosine squared theta. Now I have an equation where everything is in terms of cosine, and it's quadratic because I have the cosine squared. So I'm going to set it equal to 0. I'm going to move everything to one side. I do that, if I subtract the one, the ones actually end up canceling out, and I'm going to add cosine squared, which is going to give us a two cosine squared theta. And I already had my plus two cosine theta. We said the ones cancel out, and this is equal to zero now. Right. Now we need to look for ways to factor because I have two different terms that have the cosine. Well, if I look here, what these have in common is two cosine. So I'm going to factor out 2 cosine theta. If I do that, that leaves me with cosine theta for that first term, and then a plus 1 for that second term. Now that it's factored, now we can set each one of our factors equal to 0. So we get 2 cosine theta equals 0, and cosine theta plus 1 equals 0. And the first one here, divide by the 2, so cosine theta still equals 0. Take your inverse. Theta equals the inverse cosine of 0. Again, we think about on the unit circle where we would have a cosine value or an x value of 0, and that's going to give us pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Now, this time, because our domain is specifically between 0 and 2 pi, we don't need the plus 2 pi k because we don't need to worry about full revolutions, right? Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 are the only two values that are between 0 and 2 pi that are going to work for that factor. Now over here, we have cosine theta plus 1 equals 0. I'm going to move the 1 over, so we get cosine theta equals negative 1. Then we do our inverse, so theta equals inverse cosine of negative 1. Again, we think about our unit circle and where cosine or the x value is negative 1. The only place that's going to happen is at pi. And again, we don't need the plus 2 pi k because of our domain there. Now, there's one additional step that we have to remember on problems like this. If I square both sides of this equation up front, it's possible that I've introduced solutions that don't actually work here. Like we call those extraneous solutions. So what I need to do is I actually need to substitute these values back into the original equation and make sure that they actually satisfy the original equation before I squared it. Okay, so I'm going to start with pi over 2. I'm going to plug it back in. So we're going to get cosine pi over 2 plus 1. And we want to see, is that equal to sine of pi over 2? Again, before we square anything, that original equation, that's where we're substituting. So I need to think about cosine of pi over 2. Well, that should have a value of 0 plus 1. The sine at pi over 2 has a value of 1. 1 is equal to 1. That checks out. And so pi over 2 is one of our solutions here. Now we're going to test the 3 pi over 2. So again, we'll do cosine 3 pi over 2 plus 1. 
we want to see is that equal to sine of 3 pi over 2. No cosine at 3 pi over 2 is 0, plus 1. Sine at 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. 1 and negative 1, though, are not equal to each other, so 3 pi over 2 actually does not work this time. Okay, and then finally, I need to test pi. We have cosine of pi plus 1. We're testing to see is that equal to sine of pi. Well, cosine at pi, that's the x value. That's negative 1 plus 1. Sine at pi would be the y value. That's 0. And in this case, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. 0 is equal to 0. And so pi does work. So this time our two solutions should be pi over 2 and pi. Notice here, though, we have to ignore the 3 pi over 2 because it actually does not work in the original equation. And that's why we have to test our solutions any time you square both sides of an equation like this. All right, now number four says we want to find the values of x for which the graphs of f of x equals sine of x and g of x equals cosine of x intersect. Now, there's a couple of ways we could go about this. One way is we could actually just graph these functions using something like a graphing calculator or Desmos, and we could actually see where these things intersect each other. I want to do this algebraically, though, right, because I think, right, if you want to look at the graph and see where they cross and just tap on that point, that's perfectly fine. But I want to do this algebraically to show that we can actually find an exact value by doing this algebraically. Well, if I want to know where they intersect, what I'm really asking myself is, where are these two functions equal to each other? So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to set them equal. So I'm going to say sine of x is equal to cosine of x. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Where is sine of x equal to cosine of x? Now, we could just go through our unit circle and say, okay, where are all the places where the sine and cosine values are the same, right? That's one way to think about it. Or we could actually just try to get this all in terms of a single trig function, use our inverses, and then solve from there. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm actually going to divide both sides of this equation by cosine x. Because on the left now, I know that sine over cosine is equal to tangent. And cosine over cosine is just 1. And so now I have an equation where tangent x is equal to 1. And now I can use my inverse. So we're going to take the inverse tangent of both sides. That gives us the inverse tangent of 1 over here. And now we just need to think about, well, where is tangent equal to 1? Well, that's going to give us pi over 4. And remember, tangent has a period of pi, and so we don't need to find a second value. We can only worry about that one, and then we can just say plus pi k. So these are all of the values now where those two graphs would intersect each other. And again, there will be an infinite number of those points, right, because sine and cosine are periodic. Um, and so they're going to continue to intersect an infinite number of times. And that's why we need that plus pi k to make sure we're taking care of all of those possible intersection points. All right. Now this one, we've got 2 sine of 3 theta minus 1 equals 0. Now, we've actually got only a single trig function this time, right? There's only a sine in this equation. So I'm just going to try to isolate it like I would have in the previous section. So my first step, I'm going to add the 1. So that's going to give us 2 sine 3 theta equals 1. Now I'm going to divide by 2. So we get sine 3 theta equals 1 half. And now if I want to get rid of the sine, I'm going to take the inverse sine. So 3 theta is equal to the inverse sine of 1 half. Well, I can simplify the inverse sine of 1 half now. So we're going to get 3 theta. And remember, we're going to get two different values here, right? So I'm going to slide this over. 3 theta equals pi over 6. And 3 theta equals 5 pi over 6. 
Now, remember, if we're focused on all the possible solutions, we also need a plus two pi k. Once you take that inverse, that's where you're going to put the plus two pi k. So right here at this step, I need to go ahead and put plus two pi k on both of those answers. Now I still need to solve for theta because I still have a three in front of it. Well, to get rid of that three, I just need to divide. So I'm going to divide everything here by three. If I do that, pi over six divided by three is actually pi over 18 plus, and now two pi k over three becomes two thirds pi k. And we'll do the same thing with the other factor over here. We get divided by three, theta equals, 5 pi over 6 divided by 3 is 5 pi over 18 plus, and again, 2 pi k divided by 3 is 2 thirds pi k. So those are all the possible solutions to that equation now. And notice, it's important that we put the plus 2 pi k before we do the division by 3. Okay, because really the thing that we're adding to each of these theta values now is 2 thirds pi k, not 2 pi k. Now, the second piece of this says to find all the solutions that are just in the interval um, from 0 to 2 pi. Well, I know pi over 18 is one of those. So we have pi over 18. I also know that 5 pi over 18 is going to work. So 5 pi over 18 is another value. Now, to find another value that might work, I'm going to add 2 thirds pi k to each one of these, basically 2 thirds pi over and over and over again. I'm going to start with pi over 18. I'm going to add 2 pi over 3 now. I need a common denominator. So this becomes pi over 18 plus, and then this I have to multiply top and bottom by 6. So that's going to give us 12 pi over 18, which is 13 pi over 18. Now, 13 pi over 18 is still smaller than 2 pi, so that's another value that's going to work for us this time. Do the same thing with the 5 pi over 18. I'm adding 2 thirds pi or 2 pi over 3. Common denominator. gives us 12 pi over 18. And so we get 17 pi over 18 this time. Again, 17 pi over 18, still smaller than 2 pi, and we're good. Now I need to keep going. Okay, so I'm going to take the 13 pi over 18. I'm going to add another 2 pi over 3, which we know common denominator is going to be 12 pi over 18. So I'm going to go ahead and write it that way. That's going to give us 25 pi over 18. So 25 pi over 18 is still smaller than 2 pi, and so that value works as well. And I'll do 17 pi over 18 plus another 2 pi over 3, or 12 pi over 18. That's going to give us 29 pi over 18. 29 pi over 18, again, still smaller than 2 pi. That value works also. Now, just to show you real quick, 2 pi, if I want to have a denominator of 18, would be 36 pi over 18. So if I ever go beyond that, then I've gone beyond 2 pi and I can stop. Well, if I add 12 pi over 18 to 25 pi over 18, that's actually going to give us 37 pi over 18 which is bigger than 36 pi over 18. That's too big. And so we're already too far. These are the only solutions that are going to work then. And so I have six specific values between 0 and 2 pi based off of those solutions that I got this time.
And then our final example here, so we've got square root of three tangent of theta over two minus one equals zero. Again, I only have a single trig function tangent this time. I wanna to try to isolate that. So I'm gonna start by adding the one. So we're gonna get square root of three tangent theta divided by two equals one. All right, now I'm gonna divide by the square root of three. So we're gonna get tangent theta over two equals one over square root of three. Now, if you'd like to, we could rationalize that. And so that would actually give us square root of three over three. So either way you wanna think about that is perfectly fine. Now at this point, remember, we're going to take the inverse. So when we do that, we get theta over two equals the inverse tangent of either one of those values, right? So I'll write it as square root of three over three, just because those are the values that are actually in our charts and things like that. Um, so if we take the inverse tangent of square root of three over three, that should give us pi over six. So we get theta over two equals pi over six. And remember in this case, this is where we would put our revolutions, but the period of tangent is just pi. So we're really just gonna add pi k this time. In our last step, we need to multiply everything by two, which is gonna give us theta equals pi over six times two is pi over three. And then pi k times two is two pi k. So that's all the solutions to that equation now. Now the next piece says we want to find all the solutions that are just in the interval from zero to four pi. Well, we know pi over three works, right? So pi over three is one of our solutions. And this time I have to add two pi over and over again and to see what our other solutions are going to be. So we're going to have pi over three plus two pi. The common denominator here gives us six pi over three. And that's going to give us 7 pi over 3. This time, we only want to look between 0 and 4 pi. So again, thinking about 4 pi with a common denominator, that's going to be 12 pi over 3. So if I go beyond 12 pi over 3, I know I've gone too far. So 7 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. It's 13 pi over three, that's bigger than four pi, that doesn't work. So my only solutions this time are gonna be pi over three and seven pi over three if I'm just on the interval from zero to four pi. So again, all of the possible solutions are pi over three plus two pi k but then the specific solutions that are between zero and four pi are those two that we found at the bottom there. All right, so that's all we've got for this unit. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know, and I will see you next time.